All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the McMaster Health Forum. For those of you who are in the room with us and those of you who are online on the webinar, welcome. Uh, we're coming to you from the McMaster Health Forum, which is uh, at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And this is the uh, most recent in our series of webinars by our Queen Elizabeth Scholars. Um, here's a quick agenda for what we're going to cover today. I'll give you a quick little summary of uh, who we are, the McMaster Health Forum, what the scholarship program is about. I'll introduce you to our two presenters today. So this is our only webinar where we have two presenters. So Ina and Dave, uh, they will be talking about improving the healthiness of food environments in the Caribbean. There'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. So if you're in the room, uh, just put your hand up and we'll get to you. Uh, if you're online, I'm gonna ask that you please use the chat box to type in your questions. So the uh, McMaster Health Forum is a leading hub for improving health outcomes through collective problem solving. Uh, we harness information, convene stakeholders, prepare action-oriented leaders, and we act as an agent of change by empowering stakeholders. The Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program is run by a partnership between Rideau Hall Foundation, Community Foundations of Canada, Universities Canada, and Canadian Universities. The purpose is to activate a dynamic community of young global leaders across the Commonwealth to create lasting impacts both at home and abroad through cross-cultural exchanges, discovery and inquiry, and professional experiences. Here at the Forum, our Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program is called Strengthening Health Systems, and our scholars contribute to strengthening health systems and become part of our large and growing network of health system leaders. Here is a list of our current Queen Elizabeth Scholars. Uh, we have 13 in total uh, as incoming scholars, outgoing scholars, or outgoing interns. Two of those people are here today doing a presentation for us. Our first Queen Elizabeth scholar is Ina. She, uh, at the time of her scholarship, was an undergraduate student in the Bachelor of Health Sciences program at McMaster University. Uh, prior to her internship, she investigated uh, her interest in the social determinants of health and factors contributing to disease through her experiences in a clinical pediatric research setting, investigating motivators for adolescent lifestyle habits. She is currently a student in the MD program at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Medicine. Our other presenter today is Dave. Uh, Dave, at the time of his internship, was also an undergraduate student in the Bachelor of Health Sciences program here at McMaster. His research interests center around, around how primary care models can be tailored to vulnerable populations, including persons with complex health needs and persons with mental illnesses. Dave is now a student in the MD program here at McMaster's Michael DeGroote School of Medicine. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our two guest speakers for today, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you for your introduction, James. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. My name is Dave. My name's Ina. Uh, and we are two of the 2016 Queen Elizabeth Scholars in Health System Strengthening here at the McMaster Health Forum. This past summer, Ina and I had the chance to go to Trinidad and Tobago and work at the Caribbean Public Health Agency under the leadership of Dr. Andrea Yearwood. While we were there, we had the chance to help implement a stakeholder dialogue focused on improving the healthiness of food environments in the Caribbean which will be the focus of our presentation today. Okay. <laughs> so first we're gonna be presenting the background information necessary to understand how and why the stakeholder dialogue was conducted. This will include an introduction to Trinidad and Tobago, an introduction to the Caribbean Public Health Agency, and some background information on how exactly stakeholder dialogues are conducted. Following, we'll, present, we'll be presenting the findings from our stakeholder dialogue with first a background information on what exactly the Caribbean nutritional environment looks like, what options there are to improve the nutritional or food environment, and what factors we need to consider when implementing these options. Finally, we'll be discussing what exactly we learned during our internship. So starting off, we're going to talk about Trinidad and Tobago, and then dive into Tobago, and then dive into a little bit about what Carpa does. So I threw a map onto here, keeping in mind that maybe people don't exactly know where Trinidad is. So here's a map of the Caribbean in general, and we see Florida up there in the upper left corner, and we see the string of Caribbean islands, and right along the bottom, near Venezuela, we see the island nation of Trinidad and Tobago. And it's actually composed of two islands, being Trinidad and Tobago, and between the two of them, the population is about 1.2 million, a little bit over that. Now, a lot of that population is clustered in Trinidad itself, as it is kind of, A, an economic hub for the Caribbean in general, but also a bit of an urban hub for the country. We were living in the capital of 
uh, of Trinidad and Tobago being Port of Spain, and that's also where carp is found. Now, won't dive into this too much, but in addition to just this amazing natural environment that Trinidad and Tobago has to offer, it also has a very rich history um, in terms of its colonial history, and that has led to this very interesting mosaic of cultures, as well as a mosaic of foods, which is going to come into the discussion in a little bit. And finally, it is a member state of CARICOM. CARICOM. That stands for the Caribbean Community, and it is a grouping of 20 Caribbean countries, including 15 member states and five associate member states, associate member states, and it's really just a union working towards promoting welfare in the Caribbean region. It stands on the pillars of economic integration, foreign policy coordination, human and social development, and security. Now, the reason that we bring CARICOM in today is because CARICOM is responsible for forming organizations, potentially, that might help it accomplish its mandate. So one of these organizations that CARICOM did strike is the Caribbean Public Health Agency, or CARFA, which is where we spent a lot of our time between May and July of this past summer. So the Caribbean Public Health Agency, CARFA, was formed in 2013 through a merger of Bear with me for a second. Um, the Caribbean Environmental Health Institute, the Caribbean Epidemiology Center, the Caribbean Food and Nutrition Institute, the Caribbean Health Research Council, and the Caribbean National Regional Drug Testing Laboratory. Now, the only reason that that is being brought up is just to show you really the breadth of, um, of the mandate of CARFA, because it now fulfills the mandates of all five of those former organizations. Now, CARFA's main focus is sorry, is on a regional response, a Caribbean regional response to both communicable and non-communicable diseases, as well as injury with a focus on surveillance, management, and prevention. And this is the structure of the organization, just to position ourselves within it. So you see along the bottom, there are corporate services. Um, there is surveillance, disease prevention, and control. We did not spend um, any time in that section, but CARFA does have a whole kind of section of its complex dedicated to labs. They do a lot of research on communicable and non-communicable diseases, but uh, this past summer we did see a lot of a focus on mosquito-borne illnesses, in particular Zika, as that was um, a big issue this past summer and still is to date. We also see the um, Strategic Planning and Resource Mobilization Partnership Unit, and between all of those, we see the Research Training and Policy Development Unit, and that is where we spent our summer. So we were under the supervision of Dr. Andrea Yearwood, who is a Senior Health Policy Analyst at CARFA. And we kind of undertook a variety of tasks throughout the summer to support this unit, as well as some other units where we were necessary. So the first one that we're talking about today is support for the stakeholder dialogue on nutritional environments. Also, one of our major projects throughout the summer was a scoping review on best practices in public health. We also helped with a review of interventions to prevent childhood obesity. We assisted in the development of a user experience survey for, for the evidence portal. And the evidence portal is a new portal that CARFA has been developing um, and is developing and is currently launching. So user experience was a very important component throughout the summer. And finally, we conducted some preliminary research for the development of a health policy course. And CARFA is hoping to, in the near future, launch a health policy course. So we kind of just did a little bit of work into how are these being run across the world and what, uh, and a survey on what Caribbean member states would want out of a health policy course. All right, so we are here today to present about a stakeholder dialogue on food environments in the Caribbean. And the reason that we chose this topic as opposed to some of the other tasks that we worked with is we thought it would give you a little bit of an idea as to what some of the challenges that the Caribbean region in general is facing. But before we do that, what exactly is a stakeholder dialogue? Now, recognizing that I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, um, as a lot of these are done at the McMaster Health Forum, uh, just an overview for anyone online who may not be too familiar with them. So here at MHF, I really like this sentence from the website, so um, I borrowed it, sourced up there, but they said it is to, the purpose is to ensure relevant evidence on pressing health concerns is used to fuel action for improving health outcomes through collective problem solving. Now the way that this is done and the way this, that this was done in CARFA was first and foremost, data was collected and synthesized in the form of an evidence brief. 
Then this evidence brief was disseminated to a collection of relevant stakeholders that were identified, um, in this case, relevant stakeholders to food environments. Then these stakeholders were invited to an open, moderated, and off-the-record discussion to try to come up with some options for solutions to these issues. And finally, a dialogue summary was prepared and later disseminated to hopefully try to apply some of these options. And this brings us to June 22nd, 2016 in Providence, Salas, Turks and Caicos, which was, I mean, if I do say so myself, a beautiful place to hold a stakeholder dialogue. And it involved 20 participants from both the Caribbean and beyond the Caribbean. And these included people like policymakers and advisors, people like researchers, leaders in relevant non-governmental organizations and the private sector, um, people from the legal sphere. So really all kinds of different multi-sectoral stakeholders. Now, they got together to have this discussion on Caribbean food environments, including the problem, options, and implementation considerations. Thank you. And now we'll be discussing the Caribbean food environment. And you may be wondering, what exactly is a food environment? And this describes all the different factors that influence the dietary choices we make every single day. And these factors can be divided into three categories. First, there are the physical factors. Where is food located and what foods are available? Then there are the economic factors. How much does food cost? What factors influence the price of food? And how much money are we willing to spend on food? Finally, there are the sociocultural elements. What is the sociocultural attitude towards different types of foods? What beliefs are there around eating food and how do they affect our choices? Moreover, all these different categories can be divided into the macro environment and the micro environment. The microenvironment is what we see every day. It's what foods are available around us and what decisions in our immediate community, such as our family, will influence our decisions. The macro environment are factors that affect our food choices that we might not necessarily see. It relates to government policy, private sector regulation, and broader sociocultural beliefs. Now, the reason why we're concerned with the Caribbean food environment and understanding it is because it's been very well linked through clinical and population studies that unhealthy food choices leads to an increase in non-communicable diseases such as type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, and hypertension. This is incredibly troubling for the world, not only because are many of these diseases implicated in over 65% of deaths worldwide, but they actually add to our healthcare expenditure as we have to deal with a growing population uh, of people experiencing chronic health issues due to these diseases. In response to the high instance of NCDs worldwide, there's been a lot of interest internationally from organizations such as the WHO to develop policy to counteract them. Within the Caribbean, numerous organizations, including CARICOM, have actually suggested some policies on how NCDs can be best managed. Prior to the stakeholder dialogue, as Ina mentioned, there was an extensive review of the research evidence in order to understand what exactly is happening in the nutritional environment in the Caribbean. And rising out of this analysis, there are two main elements to the problem that affect the nutritional environment and consequently lead to an increase in NCDs. The first is food insecurity. The Caribbean food environment is characterized by three characteristics that all interact with one another. The first is that the Caribbean imports much of its food internationally in the form of energy-dense, nutrient-poor foods. Uh, these can be things like sugary drinks or prepackaged breads. Secondly, Caribbean nations have a limited resource base. Many of them don't have a substantial amount of space for agricultural uh, purposes, fisheries, and poultry. Moreover, the space that they do use towards these endeavors can actually be at risk of natural disasters such as hurricanes. Finally, due to their small size, these Caribbean nations don't necessarily have a strong influence on global food market prices. And you can view them as price takers where they will take whatever food is available on the market. And if there's an increase in a necessary goods price internationally, the Caribbean nations will be faced to pay that increase. The second factor that interacts with food insecurity is vulnerable groups. There are several groups in the Caribbean, namely young children, as well as those in a low socioeconomic position who are especially affected uh, by food insecurity. These include a factor such as substantial market of unhealthy food in the Caribbean nations. In fact, it's been found that many children in the Caribbean are exposed to unhealthy marketing 
regularly through TV and later choose to try to find these foods in their community. This is further compounded by the issue that there is a lot of unhealthy food near and around schools, as well as workplaces. One study noticed that students who receive more money to buy food in areas that have unhealthy food options actually had a higher BMI. Finally, especially for those in a low socioeconomic position, there are many people in the Caribbean who live in food deserts, and these are regions where there's not a lot of healthy food options available. During the dialogue, the stakeholders came together and tried to decide whether there's any additional problems that are not being analyzed in the research evidence or whether these problems could be reframed. First of all, it was noticed that the issue of food insecurity might not be correctly framed. One participant suggested that Caribbean nations are not food insecure. We actually do have access to a lot of foods that are healthy. Rather, we lack food sovereignty, which is control over the price and production of our foods. Another point that was brought up is that importing a lot of food is not necessarily an issue. Rather, it's a question of how healthy is the food we're importing. Is there a way to maintain the same level of imports, but at the same time discourage the amount of unhealthy food coming in? The third point is that economic and health policy objectives are often at odds. The way we currently organize international trade for food in the Caribbean is based on a free market model, which enables Caribbean nations to receive cheaper food. However, it comes at the cost of healthcare goals, such as reduced NCD incidence. In addition, the participants notice that there's a very strong cultural element to the NCD rise in the Caribbean and our food insecurity. Caribbean nations have made unhealthy foods both a part of their culture, what they expect to receive in their countries, and in addition, many local foods themselves are actually unhealthy. Many times in Trinidad, Ian and I would go out for breakfast for a common breakfast food called doubles, and this is effectively fried bread with chickpeas on top, which while very delicious, might not be the best decision if eaten every single day. Finally, uh, while there are growing efforts to increase educational awareness on nutrition in the Caribbean, collectively the Caribbean nations may need an increase in further nutritional programming and education to better understand how to manage their food choices. All right, so the first option presented both in the evidence brief and then later discussed within the um stakeholder dialogue was to develop mechanisms to support sustainable implementation of a whole of government response to create healthier food environments. That's a little bit of a mouthful. The main idea here is to really support intersectoral collaboration to address this major issue that Dave just spoke about. Now the term whole of government is an interesting one because not only does it refer to different ministries and this is very important and it was discussed actually at length within the dialogue was discussed the potential collaboration between an agricultural ministry and a health ministry since they're both such big stakeholders in food but also different levels of government. So for example a national government coordinating with local governments in order to reach some common goals. Now this option can include a variety of different components and these can include ensuring uh, proper structures and arrangements in order to govern this intersectoral collaboration as well as evaluation mechanisms to make sure that policies are being coherent between sectors. Now in terms of research findings, there actually weren't any research finding, or sorry, there were no systematic reviews identified that spoke to the mechanisms that were proven to um, support intersectoral collaboration, but there were a couple of research, there were a couple of systematic reviews, I apologize, that uh, spoke to how effective it is. And these actually came back with mixed reviews. So there was one, for example, that I put up here that spoke to um, a government that aimed to address social determinants of health. And there was another research or systematic review identified that spoke to um, home care, providing elderly home care. And the research evidence was really that there was moderate to no effect. So there were mixed effects proven here. And then a single study within the, um, that came out of the Caribbean did identify that collaborative planning and goal setting that came as a collective within this intersectoral environment did help to improve as a bit of a precondition for intersectoral collaboration. 
Now, as for what came out of the dialogue with this, there was this kind of resounding agreement that, yes, intersectoral collaboration is very important. Different levels of government collaborating is very important. However, barriers were immediately identified, too. And we will talk a little bit more at length about barriers later. But in terms of this particular option, a lot of participants were quick, were quick to point out that perhaps different sectors have very different priorities, and these agendas might conflict. Also, some key players may not necessarily know what multi-sectorality means in their own context. So these could make implementing this whole of government approach a little bit more challenging. And in order to address that, um, there was a, an at-length discussion about highlighting the need for an, the engagement of political leadership. There was a bit of a catchphrase that arose throughout the dialogue that we need to get into the heads of the heads. And the main idea there is if you get someone who is really at the top of there, overseeing a lot of different ministries or overseeing a lot of different levels of government, if this becomes one of their priorities, if they really care about it, then everything else will kind of be facilitated in order to fall into in order to fall into collaboration. And the final one was clarification of sustainable implementation process. Now this was a little bit of an interesting discussion because someone pointed out, well, how and when do we implement these or do we bring together these multiple ministries? Is, is it right at the beginning, as soon as we say, well, food environments in the Caribbean are a problem, what is every ministry, what is every level of government going to do about it? Or should it be the initiative of one particular ministry or level of government, and they bring others in as we go along? And the participants did agree that that needs to be clarified within respective government systems before um, undertaking a problem like this. The second option identified to help improve food environments was strengthening civic engagement and policy and lawmaking processes. So how can we engage the community in deciding what's best for them? In order to support understanding this objective, a review was taken of the literature to, for the specific objective of developing formal mechanisms to support the participation of civil society and the food industry in developing policies and standards. Now, civil society is any organization that has the consumer or citizen's best interest at heart. These include NGOs, MPOs, community groups, and advocacy groups. The food industry involves any organization involved in food production, distribution, or regulation, such as agricultural organizations and food distributors. Now, there are two primary findings in the research that were noted. First of all, interventions that engage citizens I do actually have a positive effect on healthcare outcomes and improved community outreach, and that's fantastic. However, another review noticed that oftentimes these engagement activities don't lead to changes in policy, and they just stop at the level of engagement. Coming out of the dialogue, stakeholders recommended three key points. First, there's a need to build alliances between health-related and non-health-related NGOs and civil society organizations. There are many civil society organizations within the Caribbean that have the potential to help support healthy nutritional environments. However, they do not currently collaborate with one another. Second is there's a need to engage or re-engage individuals who can be served as champions to improve nutrition environments. Champions are individuals who could use their platforms, such as celebrities, to really push out a message into the public eyes. And third, there's a need to appropriately message and maintain your programming for different audiences on how to best convince them that improving nutritional environments is for the best Caribbean community. For example, it might be beneficial to tell an economist in government that in, by improving nutrition environments, you actually reduce healthcare expenditure. To a parent, it's beneficial to tell them by improving nutrition environments, you help improve the health of your children. And the third and final option that was presented within the evidence brief was strengthening the legislative process. Now, this is a little bit of a behemoth task, but it does keep in mind the, the fact that in order to implement a lot of these policies, legislation does have to be made, because that's the only that is in a lot of cases the only way that there will be oversight over this policy. So uh, this option really spoke to kind of how to strengthen the legislative process within Caribbean countries. However, there really wasn't very much research identified on how to evaluate the legislative process. However, one low-quality systematic review did identify some major threats 
to um, the legislative process, and these include problem misidentification, lack of public support, lobby group opposition, and enforcement. And these are all factors that are very important to keep in mind when trying to champion a new policy. Now, in terms of the dialogue recommendations, um, the dialogue participants did bring up a lot of barriers that they did see in terms of strengthening legislation, and the focus was more shifted towards individual options and how to address this on a case-by-case -case basis. So some additional options were um, spoken about during the dialogue and then were reported in the dialogue summary. And th these are three that we're presenting to you today. So the first one is emphasizing children in the discourse. Now, this is kind of a bit of a strategy in order to get legislation pushed forward and to really build public demand for better food and nutritional environments. The reason behind this one is, well, there's been a bit of a pushback behind legislating personal choices. A lot of people saying, you know, this is my personal choice, how I eat is my personal choice. But no one's going to argue that children have a right to health and children have a right to healthy environments. So by framing this around, while well, we're making these changes to ensure that our children are growing up in an environment that can ensure that they're less prone to non-communicable diseases, that kind of shifts the discussion. Um, and that really helps in terms of, for example, advertising that Dave mentioned a little bit earlier. And it helps in terms of sugary drinks because children often reach for those. The second one that was spoken about is a bit more of a like quick fix solution, and that's implementing consumer friendly food labeling. As we know, nutrition facts labeling isn't always the most layman friendly. People don't always know how to read them. People don't always want to read them. So implementing more consumer friendly food labeling would kind of revolve around ensuring that there's increased health literacy among the consumer. So for example, there are jurisdictions in Europe where there is a traffic light system. So for example, uh, having red, yellow, and green highlighted areas of the nutritional food label based on how much of the daily value um, that particular food would include. Also, portion sizes are a bit of a, a difficult thing to understand sometimes. So one participant did really more understandable food sizes and having that mandate sizes and having that mandated to be on the packaging. And finally, adopting a sequential approach towards implementation. Now, this is a lot more of a much broader strategy, but uh, some participants did identify that, you know, we're talking about a lot of really good options here, but in order to actually lead to change within their respective countries, this needs to be done in a systematic way. These options need to be taken in a systematic way. So that includes, for example, setting achievable targets, making sure that everyone's on the same page with those targets, maybe identifying areas for legislation, identifying areas for self-regulation, and putting in place evaluation mechanisms to make sure that these options are really being carried out. Next, we'll be discussing implementation considerations. And these are fa factors that influence whether or not any of the policy options we just brought up will ever be successful. Um, furthermore, they can be two categories, barriers and facilitators. We're going to begin with talking with some of the barriers that were brought up during the stakeholder dialogue, as well as during the research review that was conducted initially. The first point that the stakeholders highlighted is that while many of the ideas on how to improve nutrition environments are strong independently, there might be limited financial and human resources available to actually implement them and monitor their implementation. In fact, one dialogue participant highlighted the fact that many efforts have already been made to improve nutrition environments. In some countries, there's already an increase uh, in regulation against what exactly private sector food companies can market. However, there's no one necessarily monitoring these policies and ensuring that private sector organizations adhere to them. Secondly, as Ina already discussed, many people might actually resist the efforts to go along with new recommendations and policies to improve nutrition environments. Citizens, for example, might feel as though they're losing some of their consumer choice and organizations might not be in favor of having to realign their foci and goal towards our broader goal of improving nutrition environments. Third, in contrast to Canada and the US, the Caribbean does not have many strong consumer advocacy groups to ensure that the citizens' voice and best interest is being heard at the government level. And finally, just by the nature of how a government is organized into departments, it can sometimes be difficult for different uh, departments to work together meaningfully on an issue when their interests might be at odds. Secondly, there are facilitators. The first facilitator that can help promote the options we just discussed 
is that there is widespread civic society and government commitment to improving healthy foods and nutrition environments. Just unfortunately, as recently brought up, they're not necessarily collaborating together at this time. Secondly, there's a very large body of evidence and a growing body of international support on how to best implement improved nutrition environments and what options there are for different contexts on how to best do so. Finally, while it can be difficult to promote intergovernment collaboration, due to the small size of the Caribbean nations, it might be easier for people in different departments to work with one another in contrast to the U.S., where thousands of people can be employed in any given department. Finally, Ian and I want to share with you some of the lessons we took away from our internship uh, during our discussions over the past few months. The first, and it's a repeated theme that has come up many times in our presentation, is that there are conflicting interests between different branches of government, between the private sector and the public sector. And consequently, during these conflicts, healthcare is not necessarily a priority. However, it is possible to work towards making it a priority by collaborating together and ensuring that everyone benefits from the new arrangement. Secondly, every country has very unique government, economic, and cultural legacies that influence what policies will work and how they need to best be implemented. Um, it actually appeared during our stakeholder dialogue that participants would discuss different ideas or different concerns they had with the policy options. And oftentimes, their concerns they had was very country specific. Um, one person from a smaller country noted that it might be especially hard for that person's country to promote any agricultural initiatives compared to a country such as uh, Trinidad or Barbados that might be a bit larger. Finally, uh, and it's a repeated theme that you'll see anywhere in health policy, the political environment must be conducive for policy changes to be made. You must get people who are leading policy and leading politics to get behind your ideas, for them to champion it into legislation. So thank you so much for listening to our presentation. We'll now take any questions. Questions from anybody in the room, uh, and if you're online and you have any questions, I'm going to ask you please type your question in the text box, and we'll uh, we'll get to it uh, shortly. Um, I will kick things off as I usually do with the web webinars and ask a question. So, uh, as I was listening to your presentation, um, I was hearing things that I've been hearing a lot here in Canada. So issues about food and proper choices and uh, making the wrong choices and children uh, making those wrong choices. So I saw a lot of parallels there. So um, asking you both, um, you're both welcome to answer the question uh, however you want, but uh, what lessons have you learned as Canadians that you could, we could potentially apply to Trinidad, and what did you learn from Trinidad that we could potentially apply here in Canada about this issue? Um, so a little bit of a preface for this one. Um, what was very different uh, kind of between the dialogues, for example, run here at the forum and the dialogue run there, was that it was a very different kind of group of people being brought together. So here we had people from, uh, sorry, at, in Trinidad, at, uh, in the forum brought together by CARPA, we had people from a whole bunch of different countries that came together to discuss the challenges within their own jurisdictions. And I think that that definitely had its strengths and had its uh, limitations as well. Uh, one of the major limitations is the fact that when you have people from different countries and really from different conditions, you're not going to come to any really immediate action items. Um, not that the goal of a, of a stakeholder dialogue ever is to have immediate action items, but uh, it does make it more challenging. However, bringing together players from different jurisdictions like that really helps to compare and contract contrast what works in certain jurisdictions and what doesn't. So I think that that's definitely a takeaway lesson is that when bringing together people from different, not only different disciplines, but also different areas, it helps to learn what there is to move forward on potentially in a, in a specific jurisdiction and learn from other places. So James, uh, returning to, I think, a portion of your initial question, which is on understanding what can we learn from Trinidad and what can they learn from us? I think for my time in Trinidad, I really came to appreciate the consumer advocacy groups we have in Canada. Uh, the state of the nutrition environment in Trinidad really points out how important it is that we in Canada have groups out there advocating to ensure that we have access to healthy food and that there's many people in, interested in ensuring that this food is available and cheap to us. 
Uh, moreover, these groups often help play a role in preventing overt marketing or overt numbers of fast food locations uh, throughout the country. Now, while there are definitely areas of Canada that might not be able to, that might still somewhat look like food deserts, uh, we're not as bad as Trinidad at this time. And I think it's because our civic society plays a very strong role in that. And it really points to the importance of strengthening civic society uh, no matter what country you're in. Thank you very much. And we have a question from the room. So just say your question and I'll repeat it for the. So the question in the room has to do with culture and uh, in the Caribbean where we're dealing with lots of different countries, we're dealing with lots of different cultures and people eat food not because it's good for them or uh, for any other reason than the fact that it's part of their culture and they're going to do it no matter what. So, uh, Ina, you want to address that? All right, so that's definitely a really good point, and we kind of glossed over it in the beginning. We mentioned it a little bit, but you're definitely right, is that a lot of Caribbean foods aren't necessarily the healthiest things. A lot of the traditional foods that they are eating and coming from different, I mentioned how it was like a mosaic of different cultures, and a lot of the time, those foods are delicious, but at the same time, not the healthiest. I think that one of the major challenges, though, being faced in the Caribbean is the fact that they import a lot of their food. So they're really borrowing, for, well, not necessarily borrowing, but they're having the foods from Western culture and they're having the advertising from Western culture. So you also have that cultural component of, Dave mentioned, it's posh to eat like someone in the States and they think that someone in the States eats 10 servings of KFC, for example, but not necessarily what they think, but um, that's what they see on TV. So that's one of the major, culture, major cultural components that needs to be addressed. It's not necessarily all of the cultural foods because keep in mind that in the Caribbean there's also an abundance of fresh fruit there's also an abundance of um, like fish well we spoke about some challenges for fisheries but there is an opportunity within the culture to eat healthy and really I think one of the major challenges that they're facing right now is the import of all the unhealthy foods and is the import of the advertising of all the unhealthy foods does that kind of make sense yeah So I recall um, one participant from the dialogue that brought up a point which might very well relate to your question. And it's the idea that culture evolves quite rapidly over time. Now, many of the cultural preferences for food in the Caribbean have actually been formed largely in the last 50 years, especially those relating to fast food that was imported from the more Western countries. Um, and recognizing that, you're right, no one's going to want to give up their doubles or their sugary drinks anytime soon. However, by recognizing that this is the issue right now, there's an opportunity to counteract that marketing and work towards finding ways to minimize that marketing's influence on the community. And that will definitely not make any sort of short-term change, but over time, that could actually change the culture and it's something worth working towards. And it's definitely something I can see happening in India as well in the long term. Just this week, um, I don't know how close this has to be. Uh, Jane Philippot was talking about food labeling. I don't know if you guys saw the article. Um, she was kind of very much talking on this issue, and she was um, summarized from a friend. Apparently, we're looking at new methods of labeling, possibly being able to be introduced in Canada, whereby we could put on the on the packaging, you know, this is 50% uh, of your daily fat or whatever. So it's right on the front of the bottle, whatever you're consuming, so you know exactly the, the effects of what you're consuming. Um, so I guess this is just saying that there are positive things from you know Canada that can go Caribbean and Caribbean that can go Canada. And maybe soon we're going to see some positive effects of these things that are uh, new policy implementations. A great presentation, by the way. It's great. I just want to say, like, I definitely hope so that it does happen. Uh, and I guess underscoring some of the McMaster Health Forum's work, there's a lot of good research evidence out there being developed in a lot of countries around the world on what like practices we can implement to improve nutrition environments and which ones work effectively. The food packaging has a ton of evidence behind it, and better food packaging is something that I would like to see implemented in many countries, not Trinidad as well. Thank you. So we have a question from a Queen Elizabeth scholar in the room. We have a, queen, a question from a Queen Elizabeth scholar online. 
so the question online I'm thinking is referring to the one slide where you listed the different activities that you did while you were in Trinidad and working at CARFA. Uh, and they want to know, uh, would either of you mind explaining more about the other tasks you got involved with during your time abroad? So of the list of things, I'll give you maybe each one that you can just expand on a little bit for the, for the audience so they can get an idea of the other things that you might have done. I actually, I want to talk about mosquitoes. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to briefly touch on our scoping review about best practices in public health. Now, the idea of best practices is actually a little unclear in the literature. Um, our supervisor, Dr. Andrea Yearwood, wants to know, in order to help further the CARFA evidence portal and understand what practices they need to share across the Caribbean, what is the best practice in public health, and how do you share it with other people elsewhere in the world? In order to answer that question, we conducted a scoping review using scoping methodology uh, of all the literature. Uh, and overwhelmingly, what we found is that there wasn't necessarily a precise definition of best practices, but there were common characteristics in how they were defined, how they're coordinated, uh, and what a best practice document looks like. Uh, going into the details of what this looked like might be a little difficult for the purposes of this question, but I'd be happy to send you what we wrote. Keep an eye out for the future blog post on that one. Um, I, I said uh, I pr wanted to speak to mosquitoes. It wasn't on the slides, but my personal kind of one of the highlights of the internship for me wasn't something that we put in there because it wasn't one of our major tasks. But uh, when we were while we were there, CARFA in collaboration uh, with PAHO were holding the Caribbean Mosquito Awareness Week. Uh, I think the catchphrase was fight the bite, destroy mosquito breeding sites. Um, so that was a really cool week and it came relatively early in our internship and uh, through some relationships that we had forged with the communication department of CARFA, we got to help out with that, which was definitely a lot of fun. So there was a day that uh, there were school children who came to CARFA as a field trip and we volunteered for the day and we led them around and we did a mosquito hunt. So we looked for places that could be potential mosquito breeding sites. We taught the, the children how to tip them over, what to do when they go home, how to look for them, um, and really try to kind of combat, combat mosquito-borne illnesses, which was a great experience, I think, for the both of us, really, because we got to learn a lot about mosquito-borne illnesses, and it was really something very local and something very current, because uh, there's obviously a very huge push towards combating mosquito All right, uh, thank you for that. Uh, any other questions from anybody in the room? No? And uh, anybody online? Somebody is typing. We'll, we'll pause for a second. Oh, thank you both. Great presentation. So uh, I don't see anybody else typing, so I'll ask another question in case uh, somebody else, uh, you know, takes a minute to think about what they want to ask. Well, I'll ask pretty much the obvious travel question uh, about food. So uh, while you are in Trinidad, uh, what local cuisine do you now miss since you're back in Canada? And while you were, and while you were in Trinidad, what did you miss uh, food-wise from home? Dave's going to go first. <laughs> Uh, as it did come up in our presentation earlier today, I, I very much miss my doubles in Trinidad. It was great to wake up in the morning, just walk out at the door and grab some fried bread with chickpeas on top. <laughs> uh, from Canada, I think, to some degree, I missed cheap and healthy foods. Uh, it was actually kind of difficult to get your hands on sugary drinks that weren't too, too sugary or a relatively healthy stuff you didn't make on your own. Most places you would go out to were a little too fried for my taste. Uh, and it's actually something that Ian and I discussed continuously in our internship. While we were studying nutrition environments, we ourselves faced difficulty eating out uh, and finding healthier foods. We joked walking through the grocery stores and seeing all the processed foods that we're like, we're doing field research. That's okay. That's why we're buying all these unhealthy foods. Um, but realistically, what Dave is saying is very true is what I missed most was being able to go to the grocery store and buy meat for less than like $12, um, which was effectively what like a small container of ground or ground, meat, uh, ground beef cost in the grocery store. So it was 
as Dave said, really difficult to eat healthy in terms of getting your proteins in, getting your dairy in. All the milk was reconstituted. There was no non-recon milk. Um, fruits in the grocery stores were expensive because surprisingly, despite, like I mentioned, the abundance of fruit that grows when you walk down the street on the trees, which is great, grocery store fruit is imported. Very expensive. Um, vegetables as well, very expensive. Obviously, those don't grow along the street, so harder to kind of find those. Uh, so yeah, I definitely missed a grocery store where I could walk out with a decently sized bill and feel as though I'm eating relatively healthy. Um, but in terms of prepared food, yes, definitely I miss the Caribbean food. I miss the roti. I miss the doubles. Um, still trying to find a good Trinidadian place in Toronto. So if anyone has one, please let me know because I would love to see it. <laughs> Mrs. <Mississauga's fun. laughs> fun. Well, thank you. Uh, again, I'll pause if there's any other questions from anybody in the room or if there's anybody online. Uh, we do have somebody who's typing, so again, I'll pause for a second uh, while they do that. Um, again, I want to thank you both for taking the time to do the webinar, and uh, something to look forward to in the future is a blog post from each of you, so uh, I know everybody's going to be interested to hear uh, or to read what you, you write about your experiences. So the question uh, online is, what was the greatest challenge you overcame through your internship? So you can take that in a lot of different ways. So, Ina? Um, personally, for me, it was kind of, you know, this wasn't anything particular to Trinidad necessarily, but being away from home personally was very tough for me because it was a little bit harder to forge relationships while we were there, given that uh, it was kind of just the two of us for a good chunk of the time, uh, especially at the beginning, who were of our own age and everyone we worked with was kind of a generation above us and everyone was exceptionally friendly, but it was still kind of end of the day, we're coming home and trying to find something to do. And it's not always uh, very safe to kind of go certain places. So um, that was definitely something to get accustomed to for me was kind of living on our own and, and being okay with that. So that is a really difficult question to answer and uh, it's something I might bring in my, in my blog post in the future. Um, but immediately coming to mind, I think I want to echo a point that Ina made. I, it was difficult for me when we first got there because it felt almost as though um, A, we did not know anyone and B, it was very difficult for us to get around. Uh, we were told, at least initially, that we should probably avoid going out at night or we should stick to our local area. Uh, and in the first month, it took us a while to learn how to explore a local area and really expand our horizons in Trinidad. Uh, but I think that once we got to explore the country a little more, we became comfortable with the environment and understanding uh, even basic cultural things like how to cross a street safely. Um, crossing a street was quite the challenge. Uh, things became a lot better. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. And we'll, we'll pause again in case anybody else has any questions. Anybody in the room interested? No? Okay. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to draw it to a close because everybody seems to have uh, gotten quiet. So uh, I'm going to assume that that means uh, everybody's good. So again, I want to thank Dave and Ina for coming in and doing their webinar and for telling us about uh, the, the work that they did in Trinidad. It sounds fantastic. Uh, I will point uh, to the slide that's on the screen right now and just note if you're interested in applying to our Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program, the first link gives you all the information you need about that. And then a sub-page within that is our QE Scholar Insights page, which, li which lists all of our Queen Elizabeth Scholar webinars, uh, and it will include all the blog post posts will be linked through there. But if you want to go right to the blog post, the third link, the MacHealthForumScholars.com, is our blog page, and as uh, our forum scholars complete their webinars, they will then be writing blog posts, which will be posted on that page. So you can read a little bit something uh, of a more slightly personal nature, of their own personal experiences, um, and they will be fleshing those out in their blogs. So please uh, stay tuned to that, and uh, check our schedule for our future webinars. And again, thank you everybody for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you at our next one. Thank you. <laughs>